Hi everyone, welcome to our Claris FileMaker training course on how to build a custom CRM in 30 days. This training is designed primarily for beginners or those of you who need kind of a refresher with the Claris FileMaker platform. Over the course of 30 days, we're gonna spend about an hour each day covering topics from the very basics of the Claris FileMaker platform in terms of the tools, the products, deployment, security, all those things you need to know about as you build a custom application. So keep in mind that towards the beginning of the training, the topics are more basic in nature. And as we get towards the end of the training, they're somewhat more advanced. I would say probably intermediate level topics. Now keep in mind this special part of this training is that while we're not only talking about the FileMaker platform, we're talking how you can rapidly customize an existing free CRM that you can download today. It's unlocked. So taking that CRM and customizing it to your organization's particular needs. Now, a couple important links to keep in mind. One is that if you need a copy of FM Starting Point, the free unlock CRM, visit fmstartingpoint.com and press the button. And then our system will shoot you an email with the current links to that CRM. If you're looking for additional FileMaker training, visit fmtraining.tv and press the bundles button. And that will allow you to get more of this highly animated and somewhat energetic training material to help you through the learning process with the Claris FileMaker platform. Lastly, if you have questions about the FileMaker platform, feel free to email us at support at rcconsulting.com. Today is going to be on multi-user parking your stuff on server. We've talked about that before a little bit. We're going to kind of revisit a little bit. Multi-user solutions is what you need to know about. A lot of you start building FileMaker solutions on your local computer, right? You build them on your Mac, you build them on your Windows computer. And then after a while, someone says, hey, that's really cool. Can I use that too? And either you give them their own individual copy, but a lot of people want to share it on the server. So if you put data in, then other people can see the data. So that is this idea of multi-user solutions, putting on the server. What does that mean to you as a beginning developer? What does it mean? If you're an established FileMaker developer, you should be able to kind of quote all this uh, from memory uh, at a very high level. Uh, but it's very, very important. It's also, if you ever take the certification test, a lot of good content for the certification. Let's talk about multi-user solutions today. So if you're building an app, here's a short version. If you're building an app on a local computer and you take it to the server, which we're gonna do here momentarily, you only really have to learn essentially two important things. Well, one, you have to put a username and password on the file at a minimum for yourself so it's not unlocked. And then you need to kind of loosely know about record locking, but you can you can experiment and learn that on your own. The other one is about global fields. Now there's, I've got kind of, I got this outline here. We got security credentials set up. We're not gonna dive deep in that. We've already spent days on security. Um, you have to turn on the correct extended privilege. So there are privileges that are, a privilege is basically a role, R-O-L-E, role, like I am a manager at RCC or the company. My role is management or CEO or whatever you want to say. Margaret is a production engineer. Her role is marketing slash video slash organizational type uh, cat herding, right? And so that would be a role that she would have. And so the goal is that you put, dip, you know, you have five or 10 people in a role and they all kind of share the same kind of credentials, right? the capabilities that's a, so a privilege is a role an extended privilege is where in filemaker you tell it that you that manages the sharing of the file so if i can go around certain areas within a filemaker file but if i want to allow WebDirect to connect to it or filemaker go to connect to it or if i want it to be accessible um, through some other web kind of technology uh, or a plugin can access it, et cetera. Those are sharing credentials. Those are managed by what we call extended privileges, right? We did talk about this before. We're going to briefly touch on this as we go through it. The two big ones that we want to talk about are really these two right here, record locking and global field behavior changes, right? Let's just leave FileMaker 20 out of it because because for the so, so for the time being, as of today, and for the next couple months or two or three months or whatever, FileMaker 19 and FileMaker 20 are the same thing. The only difference between the two is that FileMaker 20 has the ability to talk to their experimental 
Clara Studio technology. We've already demoed that. It's pretty limited. It doesn't do too much. In fact, it's kind of neat, but beyond it being, I can't think of one customer that could, I know that I could use it with because it's so limited. It's really limited. So, so this, so, so let's just remove the conversation about 19 versus 20. They both have the same feature set. I have both of them on here. In fact, intermittently when I'm demoing, I'm either jumping back and forth between Claris Pro and FileMaker Pro. It's the same, at, at the current time, it's the same product with the same feature set, okay? Lonnie's got this question over here, Margaret. If you want to copy and paste to other places, is running an app you create in uh, on FileMaker Server, so if you post it on FileMaker Server, the same app created in FileMaker 20, you're running on your own account on AWS server. Okay, so yeah, it's just a badly written question, Lonnie, and it's not your fault. My job is, I'm going to be honest with you and frank with you, I'll explain it as best I can, and if you have questions, I'll answer them. So let's talk about the basics of FileMaker server. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just park this for the moment. I'm going to put the chat out of the way. Lonnie, if, Lonnie, if you could give us feedback as I go along, whether uh, if I'm... If, if you have a clarification on the question, that would be great. First, let's start with the fact that I'm going to open up. It doesn't matter. I'm going to open up FileMaker Pro over here. When you open it up, you have a file that throws open this kind of launchery kind of thing. They used to call it a launcher. What I'm going to say is I'm going to say file, open. I could say recent, or I could say host. I'm going to say I'm going to go to my – I can go to my server on DBW13. It's a server. So this is a – this right here is a FileMaker server. This FileMaker server – it could this software is called FileMaker Server could run on Mac, Windows, or Linux. It could be in your office or somewhere else. This is a Windows server. Happens to be a, I'm a Mac guy, but it's a Windows server, so it doesn't matter. It's a Windows server running up on Amazon. Okay, it's a rented server. Basically, I've leased a piece of hardware in the Amazon data center. This data center is like football fields and football fields in a secret warehouse. They don't advertise it. They don't want terrorists to blow it up. These things are all over the place. There's ones in the West Coast, East Coast, United States, Europe, Japan, Asia, even China for what that's worth. Um, all over the place are these data centers. They're like warehouses the size of football stadiums filled with racks and racks of servers, right? And so you rent a slice of a server. That's what this server is running. This is DBW13. I, why is it 13? Because once upon a time, I had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And so over the years, some of them got shut down. We still have, in my company, I still run number 2, number 4, number 13. And then there's a bunch of uh, bigger numbers, 41, 42, 43. We have like 12 or 15 servers that we that we run. And then we manage another probably 100 or 200 for customers, right? So so just framing that. So this is a Windows server. It's on Amazon. If I want to log into the server, I said open. I said open host. Show me the file. I could go to FM starting point. Uh, the mock data one was the one we were playing with. I double click it. It would ask me for the username and password. I've already entered the username and password before. It sa I told it to save it. A little checkbox, save it. You can do that on Mac or Windows or even Go. It does that. And so it auto opens it if I'm on this specific computer. So I am logged on right now. And so this is not the same as remote, de remote desktop. The, the FileMaker software is what we would call a fat client. If you don't know what I'm talking about, fat and thin clients, don't worry about that. But a client software is you have a server and it's sending the data down to the client. The client in this case is FileMaker Pro. Uh, a fat client is a fairly large application. It does a lot on the local person's computer. FileMaker really is a fat client. It allows it. it it's beefy. It's not uh, a small like a browser would be an ultra like a thin client, a non-existent client. It's just the browser, right? But if I go over to FileMaker, here's Claris Pro, same as FileMaker Pro, but you just get the size of it. Oop, it went behind my face. It is 728 megabytes. OK, that's not really small. It's not really giant, but it's not what you call a thin client. So a thin client is like a browser. It doesn't do a lot. Thin being like paper. It's it doesn't do a lot. Browsers really don't do that much. They're not very smart. They're pretty stupid. Um, FileMaker is actually really smart because remember, you could run the whole thing just in FileMaker itself. But if you put it on the server and then FileMaker Pro accesses it, the file still fundamentally lives on the server. The file is not local. This file right here, this data right here, has been brought down. It is in RAM memory of this computer and a little bit on the hard drive, but I, I don't want to confuse people with that. Just pretend it's all in RAM memory. If I shut the computer off and I pull the plug, I could do that, but it would disconnect all of you. I'd be happy to show it to you. 
this is completely protected. It lives on the server. So my copy of Pro went to the server, downloaded the essential bits to, to draw the layout here. If I click over here on the context screen, it's going to download. Um, what it downloads is, remember we talked about Anchor Buoy? It's going to download everything it needs to support the layout. So this is the context layout. And so it's going to download everything in this yellow box right here. That's why you don't connect everything together in one giant diagram because then it has to load everything, right? And it takes it longer, right? So to do, to render the screen, it, it obviously brings down the screen, this layout with the with the blue and the buttons and the little boxes. It downloads all this data here, the table of currents for this graph. It also is going to download, and this uh, uh, Ruben was referring to this the other day. It's also going to download. 25 records in either direction of wherever I'm at as a general rule. So if I'm on record one, it's in RAM memory already downloaded on this computer the next 25 records because it's anticipating I'm probably going to click on them. Okay. You can't see this. It's all invisible. But if I click on stuff, right, if I, uh, if you go to list view, it's 25 in either direction. So if I'm, if I start scrolling right now, I start scrolling, it'll scroll really quick and then it'll chunk and slow down a little bit because FileMaker Pro here is going, Oh, oh, I need more than 25 records. <laughs> Runs to the server. Hey, I need another 25 records, right? And so then it sends you the next 25 down. And so it tries to stay ahead of you, try and anticipate what you might do, right? And so if I scroll down, it's pretty quick, and then it'll start chonking. And some of this isn't too bad because we've already been playing. Remember yesterday we were playing with this data. The newer versions of FileMaker tend to try to cache this data. It keeps track of the fact that the data hasn't changed, and it hides a lot of the data locally on your computer, right? And so it makes it run faster. But that's kind of the dance topic. The point is, is that it's downloading this data from the server. If this computer crashes right now, commits, it just it catches fire and it dies horribly. This data is totally protected. It's running on the server. And the server does back it up every 15, 20 minutes an hour, whatever we've set it up to do. So that is a fat client. Uh, RDC, remote desktop client, is a kind of a thin client where all you're getting with remote desktop is the screen redraws. So Lonnie, if you understand what I'm talking about, like if I remote into a server, remote in, I can see the screen, right? So what I want to do just for the moment, I'm walk back through this checklist again of things. So the first thing, I close the file, so now it's no longer on this computer. It's still on the server, but locally on this computer, I'm not running it. If I come over to file, I'm going to quit that one. I'm going to make sure to look at this one, and nothing is open in here. It just pops this window up here. If I have a, I'm going to have this file, this like light file X4, and what I'll do, I'll call it for, I'll call it upload. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click it and it opens automatically. Okay. So here's what happens if, uh, if I want to, I need to show the, the, the toolbar up there, or I could come over here to sharing and say, upload to host. So if I, if I show the toolbar here at the top is a keyboard shortcut view status toolbar, this button right here is the same as file, uh, sharing upload to host. So I'm going to upload the file to a server. It says, hey, your full access account does not yet have a password. So remember we said you have to set a password. So we're gonna go ahead and set a password administrative on this. It's gonna be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, very secure, set the password. So it says, okay, it, so it, instead of going the security dialogue, it kind of did it for us. It's kind of like, you know, holding my hand through the process. The file uh, will be closed before it is uploaded, right? So it's going to basically cause this window to close behind me. I say, OK. It closes the file. It says, where do you want to put this? I'm going to put it on my trial server. You'll have to have the username and password to your trial server, OK? If you're using Claris Cloud, that's their their where Claris does their own FileMaker server up in the cloud for you, right? They take FileMaker server and they host it themselves. It has some limitations um, that can cause problems, but generally, if you have very basic needs, it's okay, right? But there's always, I, I, we run into a lot of people who have run the limitations. That's why we run the full Mac, Windows, or Linux versions of FileMaker Server. You put the username there, you put the password in there, you sign in. And it says, if you get to the screen, you've already logged in correctly. And it says this file is ready to be uploaded. It's automatically going to open the file after I upload it. So I say upload. So it's actually compressing the file and shooting across the network to the server. The server is going to check the file. 
It's going to open it up on FileMaker server and host it and make it available. So the so so the hosting process is taking the FMP12 file over here, putting it on the server, and telling the FileMaker server software to open it up and to host it out on the internet, right? Or wherever you're. If you're in a local, if you have an office network, it'd be on your office. And then if your office network is configured out to the internet and the traffic can get out, then you could host it on the internet from your office. I used to do that quite a bit, uh, but now we put everything on Amazon because it's pretty reliable. So now we say it's done, right? So we say done and it's going to attempt to log into the file. I'm going to hit cancel. We'll just go through the process. So I say file, host, trial server. And it was something about something for upload. There it is. That's the file right there. It, it loaded up. So it's, I'm not logged in yet. I, this going to the server says, show me all the files on the server. I click the file. I say, okay, what's your username and password? Admin, one, two, three, four. And I'm going to sell it to save it so in the future I don't have to put the password in again, which is great as long as no, no one else has access to your computer, right? I need uh, someone else to log into this file. A couple of you Discordians that are... Uh, Looking for something to do. Okay, great. So, so here's the thing: is that if I so this data, as we understand, lives on the FileMaker server. If I create a new record, for example, I can edit the data. I can put it. This is Ruben, whatever. I'm probably spelling it all wrong, right? Ruben, then Van, and then the last name is. I create this record. As, as, as I'm typing in the record, I'm editing the record. As soon as I click out, you saw it flash over here. It saved this data to the server. It's on the server now, if that makes sense. Like if I click over here on Bob and I realize that Bob, ah, see what happened? Mark, go ahead and click out for a second, okay? Yep. So when I click into a record, here's an important thing with file, uh, FileMaker. If I click into a record and I edit, I start editing, the FileMaker server can only allow one person to edit a specific record at one time. I want all the beginning people on Zoom to think about this carefully. Only one person can edit a record at one time. Everyone can look at the record. Everyone could be looking at Bobby right now. Okay. But I put two, it was Bobby like that. What if I decide it's Bobby Van Happy? Now, I've added that in here until I click out into empty space. Until I click out the empty space, it's not saved to the server. No one else can edit this record right now. So I'm going to click out and everyone gets that update. And now I need someone to edit this. Uh, Ed's in record six. So let's say I'm going to go forward to record six here's record six and, I, and i'm looking at this but right now ed is secretly editing christian because he realized that christian is actually a c not a k and he's editing it and if i click in here and i try to edit i i say oh it's just wrong i'm gonna fix it i try to edit is ed burkle across the he's all the way across the united states on the side of the country is modifying the record you cannot use it so i can look at it but only one person at a time can edit this is uh, called record locking ed has locked the record and at the point where he clicks out he or she clicks out over here and see it's it changed right there see that and the, and now the record he exited the record so it's no longer locked so when you're editing the record you lock it when you click out it's unlocked and it's open for someone else to edit. So I click on here and I want to change it back to K. So let me make the edit. Now it's gone back to K, right? And so I'm sitting here looking at what if Ed, Ed, Ed edits it and then clicks out. FileMaker updates everyone in real time. So if Edit makes a change here, which I'm sure any second he's going to do, we will see that on screen. There it goes. It updated. So within about a half a second or a second, we get that update. That's, that is really cool with FileMaker. The data is real time. But you can't have two people editing the same record uh, at the same time. Everyone can look at it, but only one person could edit at a time. Uh, Mark is on record four. Once again, so I come over here to record four. If I click... I haven't edited yet. If I tab, I haven't edited yet. If I activate a script that tries to set a value in there, it will run into the record lock. So if you activate a script, right? Like I'm gonna change this. Oh, and it let me change it because he was in and then it's out, right? So Mark was there and he's no longer on record four. You have to actually make the edit, Mark. Reddit four. So see, there you go. Mark Johnson is modifying the record, right? So this is the thing you have to think about with the world of FileMaker is that not everyone can be editing the same record at the same time. It's a design consideration you need to think about. Um, the other one is global. So we have any questions about that?
see record two. Okay, well, it's got to be safe for work, right? If it's not safe for work. Yeah, Ruben was apparently editing the Ruben record, which I don't know what that has now become. I'm a, I'm a little concerned about that. Yeah, so there we go. <laughs> the last record? There he is. Yeah. Oh, my God. See, so he posted a photo. So that's <laughs> the benefit of FileMaker. It's pretty slick stuff. Uh, Margaret, questions on Zoom at all? Lonnie says getting there. Okay. Uh, so I think that means your understanding is getting there. Getting there. All right. So, so once again, if you click in a field, you're not editing it yet. As soon as you actually make an edit here or type something, you're going to initiate the edit before the edit can go. Is like I, when if I click the so I don't know what's going to happen right here. If I'm going to click the letter in on my keyboard, so here we go. I'm going to hold up my mouse. Here's my keyboard. I'm going to press the letter right here. When I press the letter. Before it actually will put it on the screen, FileMaker Pro is going to go to the server and say, hey, is this record free? Is it unlocked? Is it available? If it's not, I will get an error message. If it is free, the X will show up on there. So I'm going to put an X. One, two, three, X. Ron, Ron has locked the record. So notice it didn't show up. So that is the record locking. Um, so you can tab all over the place. It also has to do with scripts. So if I write a script right here, and let's just create a, a quick script because I want to cover this. So let's just say we're going to have a new script. Um, we'll call it uh, always set for Ruben with an E-N. Okay, so what we're going to do, a couple comments here. What I want it to do is that whenever I activate this script, it overwrites the person's name and always makes it Ruben's name. So I'm going to say set field. Set field is one of the, the most common script steps you'll use. It allows us to set a value. I'm going to target the context field. I want the uh, first name. It would be a name underscore first, probably. Name first right there. I can specify that his name will be R-U-B-E-N. And then it was, what is it, Durr? Is it Van it's Vander, V-A-N with a little V. Okay, so we got that. And then I'm going to duplicate it. And I'm going to put a couple extra returns in there so we can see that. I'm going to set this to the last name. Right, and I'm going to say his last the last name of the records it allows me to override and make every record uh, Ruben. I hit OK. So now we have these two right here. So this these two script steps are exactly the same as tell what you're telling FileMaker to go in there and act like a user and do it, but do it really fast. So um, if I click in here real quick, I need to find someone else. Let me click someone else real quick. Here's uh, Alana. Okay, here's Alana. Alana is an alien invader. She's not proper. We're going to overwrite her with Ruben, right? One, two, three, run script. Uh, you have one script. Oh, I have to save the changes. Ah, see, there it went. So I, I hadn't saved the script over here. I had to save the change. So let's find someone else randomly in here. There's Bu, right here where Bu is. So I'm going to hit this. Bamo. Override now it's Ruben, right? Pretty cool. I have a question. Do you want to like sit on a record and lock it real quick so I can send you a message and then people can see? Because they, uh, they want to know if you could send a message to someone to get off the record. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why don't I'm going to lock uh, record one? I'm already editing it now. Okay. So I'm going to go to record one and then I'm going to attempt to change it. Send message. Most of the time when someone's locked it like this, it's called Murphy's Law. It just means that another way of saying <laughs> happens, right? I, Richard Carlton. Oh, it's Friday. Oh, I'm done for the day. I'm going home. Okay. And the problem is, is that, you know, uh, they leave it like this for the weekend or the night or whatever. And so you have to kind of disconnect them or get them out of the thing somehow, right? So it's locked and, and you could message them all day. Right, it's kind of aggravating. So there is the ability. I don't want to get into it right now, but just keep right down the back of your mind. There is the ability to actually have inactive people log off after a period of time. It's a little bit of a hack. It's not really well implemented by Claris, but it does work. You have to make a setting adjustment on the server side, and then make a setting adjustment on the client uh, for everyone. And then after like 15, 20 minutes of inactivity, it kicks them out. Okay, Sue. So, that's that just understand that just because you can send a message doesn't mean that anyone will be there to listen to it Ed says can you communicate with someone who's locked or can tell them that uh, you want in yeah you can uh that was a part margaret did that uh cool yeah great so i uh, show that dead so yeah so ed it's great it'd be better 
if we had like a button that says, you know, Margaret, can you lock risk record real quick for me? I it would be better if I had a button here that says uh, override nuclear weapons release. Nucle nuclear weapons are authorized, right? You click that, you put your password in, and it forcibly blows the other person out. <laughs> um, that would be probably misused, but you could have administrators do it. Because otherwise, right now, for us to, to, for us to manage this, to fix this, Here's what we have to do. So, say, Margaret, go in there and lock the record. So, this is Margaret's locked the record. We're trying to get in. Margaret's locked it. We can't get in. What a pain <laughs> Margaret is, right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go uh, see if I can do this. I didn't practice this. So everyone just be cool. Trial. Too bad Jacob in here. Dot at rcc.com. I'm going to copy that 16,000 right there. So, we've done this before. I'm going to attempt to. So, now I'm trying to log on the server so I can boot Margaret out. Wouldn't have been better with my idea of a little nuclear button there and then authentication. You'd use the same authentication here, but instead I had to like remember the server, remember the 16,000, right? Put in the username and password in. Then I got to hunt for the person, right? There are 10 people logged in right now, right? So we got to look at the people logged in. Databases. Oh, Ed, Margaret. Oh, there's Margaret. She's such a piece of crap. So what we have to do is say, Margaret, and she's using Pro, and she's using an old version of Pro. What a worthless person. Would you kindly Sorry. update your FileMaker? It's 19.4. <laughs> And Sorry. next week, it's going to be something else, right? So uh, <laughs> what I can do is I can click on that, and I say disconnect. You suck. And you could try to set I, I Normally, it's two minutes. I wonder if I set it to zero, if it'll do. So you see if it does. See, I'm, uh, over here, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still locked out. So let me just do the instant death. Okay. Oh, file has been forcefully disconnected by the host. Ah, so the window. zero did work. So I booted her out. So that so you can see how you can boot them out, right? Otherwise, they're, they're going to be there in perpetuity, right? So uh, that's how you solve that problem. Mark, can you lock the first record? Let's talk about the FileMakers. Uh, so we had the script, right? So Margaret, so I'm just going to randomly, you're on record one with it locked, correct? Uh, are you talking to me? No, yeah, I have to reopen the file. I need someone to lock record one and leave it locked for me. <laughs> Who can lock record one for me? I need a victim here. Okay, Ron is locked it. Good job, Ron. Okay, real quick. So, so I say I'm on some other random record and I run the script. So the script is always set Ruben. So all it does is two set field commands. Bammo, and it works. Now, if I go to script one and I run it, what happens? Ah, so it gives me this like cryptic name and, and, and it's like because i know what we're trying to do but what if you're running a script that says process reports for the last 24 hours and and then submit it to the head of socom so Stu can be reactivated into the into the marsoc unit that he was part of before he was retired right and you're like and then you get this message you're like what the hell is this so the problem is is that sometimes you want to control the messaging so we haven't talked about uh uh Air, air capturing. Let's do that real quick. So if I say set air capture on, this is really a dumb message right here. This should be suppress the error. This should be suppress the error. All this does is suppress the error. Okay. It doesn't really capture it. It keeps it from being displayed. I guess it's kind of capture, but it suppresses it because what you're going to do is over here after you run the first one, what you're going to do is you're going to run an if statement. Remember we talked about if so if get last error, um, and basically no error, I think the error, if you have a, it's just called a lock sync error. You're trying to lock a record. You can't get into it. You're booted out. It's error 301. You can either remember that, which is what I tend to do, or you can just say if it's uh, error zero means there's no error. So we could say, if I say not equal zero means that there's some sort of error. And we could, you know, we could uh, say beep, right? And then we could say show custom dialog uh, cannot set to Ruben, right? Yeah, okay, and you say, damn. Right. And then what we do is we execute a halt because it, it never worked. It, it tried to get in. It got us an error message. Um, and so we halt like that. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to try to run it. So I'm just going to check to see what our status in here. Ron still got it locked. I'm going to go to another script real quick. Don't don't go anywhere, Ron. Just stay where you're at. I'm going to randomly pick a record, and I'm going to run it. Okay, it ran just fine. 
I'm going to go to another record and I'm going to run it. And instead of getting that weird error message, I'm going to get our custom error message. So care capture is valuable. You need to put the error capture in where you're likely to have an unexpected uh, failure, right? So setting fields, as long as you're always setting a field that no one will ever be in, but if it's mission critical, like there's money involved or something like that or something essential, like like say, for example, we seriously go in and we reactivate Ruben. He's, you know, once, uh, although Ruben's uh, a, a, a senior non-commissioned officer, but say Ruben was an officer in the Marines or the Navy, right? Um, and there's a little clause in the way the military works in the United States, that if you're an officer and you're retired, it doesn't matter. My dad's 75 and, and is a, f a stellar helicopter pilot. They could reactivate his SAR. <laughs> probably regret doing it because he'd drive him insane, but uh, they could reactivate him. So let's pretend we're going to reactivate Ruben, right? So that's kind of an important thing to do. You wouldn't want to just set an email saying, I've notified Ruben to show back up to work. And you assume it works. You assume it works. I, the computer said it did it. Well, actually, it failed to do it because it couldn't set the Rubens record, right? It couldn't email them. It couldn't do something. And so that's what error capture is about. If you have something important where someone will get yelled at or money's involved or bad karma is going to happen, you need to make sure you, you, you do error trapping. So once again, if you look at the script, what you do is you, you do something. This has to be an action, right? An action like do something, blow something up, print something, email something, go to layout. Uh, go to a related record. Then you test for the error. And then what, what do you want FileMaker to do if it runs into the error? Okay, makes sense. Questions? I have some from Ruben. Uh, with booting people from server, does it keep the database without errors or do problems occur with booting guys? If you boot someone and say they're half editing the data, right? So say um, I'm over here and I get to, I start a new record. Okay, a new record. I'm, I'm putting data in. I got all this stuff, doing all this stuff. Um, and say I'm tabbing from spot to spot and I'm putting all this data in and then I go to lunch, right? I'm right here and I go to lunch and then I go straight to home, straight to vacation and I'm gone for a week. If they, if they blow me out, the data that I was putting in may not be saved and may never be saved the server and it may be lost. That's called bad people policy. And, you know, you need to, I don't know, beat your uh, employees into shape or explain to them that they need to save their stuff. I don't know what else to say, like maybe a big save me button down here. Cause the problem is with FileMaker, FileMaker saves automatically if you click out. So if I'm in browse mode, I'm in layout mode, but if I'm in browse mode, I'm clicking field to field to field and editing. I have to click out around somewhere or I have to run a script with a commit record on. But if you click out of the field into like dead space around any dead space, FileMaker goes, oh, you're going to save the data. It sends it to the server, says save it, and it releases the record. That's what save is in FileMaker. It's really, it's very, it's very automatic and can be intuitive unless you're a programmer and then you're wondering how the hell they did this, right? So if you're tabbing, 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 you never save it, and then someone boots you, that data is going to be gone. We have, we've had that happen with FileMaker Go. People will be doing a bunch of data. They take a picture of something in FileMaker Go. Then they put their device down, right? It goes to sleep. They forget about the device for a couple of days for whatever reason. When you wake it up, it should restore back to that spot if it can, but maybe it can't for some reason. And you lose that data. And I get this call from the customer. Once again, we had that customer. I told you the dog ate my homework. Richard, FileMaker ate my homework. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, ate my homework. No, you just never saved it. Now, it's that's why I'm here to educate you, right? We're educating people. But you got to save the data, right? So on Go users specifically, if they're taking a bunch of pictures, and I know they haven't committed, I can have like a big fake button pop up says save, and it's not been hit yet, right? Please save, right? And as soon as they do it, we commit the record. I change the graphics so it says, oh, it's all saved. That way they know that they took a picture, but they haven't really saved it yet. Does that make sense? So that's the one area where very rarely do we have people lose data in Pro, but with Go with picture capturing and then they take a phone call and they put the phone down or the tablet down it's not uncommon with customers to say hey it, it's I, I swear it was in here i swear it was in here and i didn't do anything well that's that's true 
So as a developer, you have to kind of think about that a little bit, okay? Record locking, let's talk about globals. And then that basically is all the essential pieces you need. So really hosting the file, this is it. So really, if you think about this, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, two people can't drive the same car at the same time, right? I mean, even in driver training, if you ever had a driver training where the student's on the one side driving the car and the instructor's got their little extra steering wheel, a little gas and brake pedal and stuff like that. You can't have two people really staring the car at the same time. So it makes sense that the people would crash into each other. And so FileMaker handles that interaction, that intersection of crash very well. First person gets it locked. The next person gets the error message. Pretty straightforward. The globals is a little bit of, of a more of an interesting scenario. So I'm going to close this file out. I'm going to start with a brand new file real quick just to talk about this. So if we have a, I only start with a very simple file like this. Contacts, globals. All right, so here's a very, 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 very simple uh, solution here. It's a starter solution, um, beyond simple, really basic. So Mr. Richard Carlton, I'm assuming that works. Okay, there it goes. So we have global field. So what is a global field? A, 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 a global field, and they're still called global fields. Claris in their marketing di 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 documentation says it's a text field or a number field or whatever kind of field with global storage. So you say, I always like to put G underscore on them so I know it's a global. G underscore temp name. All right, create the name. Thank you. Options. So it's not a global yet, it's a text field. Say options, you go over here to storage, you say it's global storage, right? Pretty straightforward. Is you have a global field. So if you have the field on the screen and I put it at the top, Say the field is right here. I put it at the top, browse mode. So I have new record. I say new record. I put some stuff. If I go over here and I put Ruben in here again, okay, one value is in here. No matter what record I'm on, it's always Ruben up here, right? So that's what a global is. So here's the how, way, way globals work. And I'm not going to really demonstrate this, but I'm going to explain it to you. The way globals work on the server is that if I close this file right now, it's the word Ruben was in there. It was local. Okay. If I come over here, right? Uh, actually, I can I can actually demonstrate this. This is great. So I say a Ruben. I say it's this initial value. Okay. There's the initial value of Ruben. Okay. I got three records in here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post this file to the server. I'm gonna say set password. It's gonna be one two three four one two three four set password. It's going to close it. It's going to go to the trial server. I'm going to upload. I did all this before. I'm doing the exactly the same thing again. It's going to open the file. Okay. It's uploaded. It's there. I'm going to say open. It's admin. One, two, three, four. Auto open. So I am in currently FileMaker Pro. This is a copy of FileMaker Pro. I have another copy of FileMaker on my computer, conveniently called Claris Pro. Once again, they are nearly identical. Okay. I'm going to say open host. Go to the trial server, find the file called Contact Globals, and it opens it. Okay, now, this one, if you watch up here at the top left, this is in FileMaker Pro, this is in Claris Pro. So the computer thinks that these are two separate clients, two separate people. It doesn't matter that I'm on the same computer. It's going to treat them as two separate people. When I opened it, the value came through. If I change the global value over here to underscore stew, and I say Marsock, notice it doesn't change over here. When you open up a copy of FileMaker on a host, the globals will be set to whatever they were when it was, when it was closed as a single user file. It, this is the only like little confusing part about it. So they were set to Ruben initial value when I uploaded to the server. Therefore, everyone who opens the file will initially say, see Ruben initial value. Notice it's Stu Marsock over here. This one over here doesn't see Stu Marsock. This one could say um, Michelle, right? Now I'm going to close both of these and I'm going to open them back up. So here is the one over here. This is FileMaker Pro. And if I go to Calaris Pro and I say open recent and I open it up again. So what it does is that it, the globals are never saved once it's in a host environment. They're ejected. So in the book, uh, the, um, the co-author of the book that I, we wrote, the, the, the basic beginner for books, he, we, he, he called these private global fields. 
when you're on the server because they're private to you. Over here, I could say whatever I want to say. Blah, 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 blah. It's private to me. When I close the file, they're gone. Now, the rub is, is that you opened it you opened it and it came back with the initial value. So as a developer, what you want to do is think about doing is running a startup script. So I don't see any startup scripts here. So I'm going to create a startup script. We have not covered this before, but I'm going to cover it right now for all of you. So this is a script that runs on start. Script, startup script. And what it's going to do, it's going to go to a layout. We always want to tell it what layout to go to. I'm going to go to the layout called so yeah, typing too fast, go to layout. There it is. I want to go to layout called probably the contact details. Okay, there it is right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say set field, the global. I'm going to target the global and I'm going to blank it out. Okay. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a pause in here of three seconds. I'm going to put with a three second pause in here for a duration of three seconds. Okay. And so you're actually going to see this happen. I'm going to save it. Now, I've created a startup script here. The fact that it's called startup script doesn't matter. It could be Baby Blue Rover Friday. Okay. What you have to do is you have to go fi uh, file, file options, script triggers, script triggers on first window open. This used to be in the old days, they would call this the startup script. And then they added a bunch of other triggers that do things, right? You could also do it when the, when every window opens or when it closes. On window first open, it's going to start up script right there. And someone just created a Richard script, which is nice. That's awesome. Or maybe I did that earlier. I know I did that earlier. All right, so it's going to run this script right here. And then maybe it'll beep for me or something, right, or whatever. But you'll see it happen, okay? So I'm going to save this. I'm going to close it. 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 So what will happen, right? The global we, that, that we edited has not been saved. So it's going to have that Ruben stuff in there. So part of a startup script is always to reset all your globals and, and like neutralize them and make them happy, right? So I'm going to say uh, open reset, or I can say go to host, go to trial, find the file called contact globals. It's there. And then it's gone. See that? So that was a pause in there. So the startup script does clean up for us, right? It's a good thing to do because it's hard to always control the globals uh, when you open the file and close it. Remember all that kind of stuff. So it's better to have a startup script that you use to kind of do a little cleanup. Um, and so those are really globals and record locking are the two big things you got to think about and passwords, I guess, to a degree on a multi-user solution. And it says, if I accidentally upload it with a value in a global and it should be blank, how can I close it on the server and clear it out? Uh, yeah, you have to close the file. To, so to fundamentally fix it, so Ruben's not in there anymore, you have to go to the server, close the file, somehow open that file on pro, edit the global, close it, then reopen it on server. Only pro running locally on the file can can fundamentally edit that saved value, if that makes sense, okay? Like if you go to uh, FM starting point, right? And you open this up, uh, well, this is the old one here. Let me find a, a fresher one here. Here's a fresh one. So here's the file right here. If I go script, script workspace, I'll find the startup script, which is probably in here. 001 startup. So this is the startup script, the starting point, right? We've already done a lot of the work for you, but you'll see us go in here and uh, here's the calendar, the variables for the calendar. We reset, uh, these are variables that we set for the calendar. So globals, you can reset globals. You could also preset up your variables too. Variables are never saved on the file. Even locally, the variables are never, ever, ever saved. So once again, a variable, which we talked about a day or two ago, whenever that was, they're never saved. A global will be saved if you are running the file locally by yourself on a copy of Pro. Okay, so that set that resets the variables. Is there any globals in here? Yeah, there's a global right there. So there's a global field right there that we're not sure how it'll be when people come in. So we re we set it, we reset it to what we want it to be. Another global right there, another global right there. We re another global right there. So part of our startup script is to kind of do the opening maintenance. So everything is nice and happy, right? The, the startup script is what we do to ensure that it's like a like when I'm flying the helicopter, I got a checklist and I go through the checklist. And before I pull the power on and fly away, 
Start the pre-engine start checklist. Check, 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 check. The engine's ready to start. Start the engine. Check, check, check. Check the system. Make sure it's working. Check, check, check. The startup script is your checklist for launching your file to make sure that when the user gets it, it's fully ready. Worrying about whether there's a value in the global or not, it's better just to run the checklist and clear it and set it to what you need it to be. Does that make sense? I don't worry about its native state almost ever because it because you can't get past the startup script. The startup script must run. It's the first thing that always happens. I, I guess if you're an OCD, you could go and clean that. If it had a bunch of data, say you had like four gigabytes of text and, and you could have a global image in there, a global container. Say you had that all that in there, and then every time people opened it, it would send them that picture and the four gigabytes of text. Obviously, there's a performance penalty for not cleaning it out. But most of the time, a global fields will look as dumb as that one is with like that much data in it or something. If you have a book in there, then yeah, it's good. I mean, how how hard is it for you it, to send that to you? It's not, you know, it's unnoticeable. But if you have a whole book in here, like tarics and tax and paragraph and paragraph and paragraph and paragraph and paragraph of books, and it's a big long thing, yeah, then. Clearing it will help your performance if you have a book and pictures and stuff in there. So that's it. Clear should have uh, not have built the difference in global field and a server global field. I will only tell you that back in the old days, there were globals didn't exist. When server was first created, out, created I don't think globals existed. Or maybe the, the first global was invented the time they created the first server. I don't remember that because that's all 93. I don't remember the exact sequence of events with that. I remember that FileMaker 2 was out and we got global somewhere, maybe in three, but in FileMaker 2, there was a FileMaker 2 server. And basically it works a whole hell lot like the ones we have right now, essentially. Um, keep in mind though, that with modern versions of server, I can do all the editing and development I want while the file's on the server. Back in the old days, you couldn't add new fields or delete fields or do stuff like that while it was on the server. These days, you could park the file on the server. You can change everything except the global and a couple other super minor in the weeds details that I'm not going to bother you with. But um, you could do all, that's why whenever we build a solution, because we want it backed up all the time and protected against crashes, is that we put it on the server, the server backs up every 15 minutes or an hour, whatever we send it to. We always have great backups and we do the development from the FileMaker Pro, Mac or Windows right to the server and the server can be Mac, Windows or Linux, right? So um, once again, in the old days, the server, you couldn't do as much development work on it. It would be great to have public global fields. You can, you can. Global public fields are what we could do in a prefs table. So we'll bring that up another time, but we do that. That's what we have a single record, a single table with a single record called prefs. And when we say values in there, they are shared across all the users, right? So if I go into FM starting point here and we take a look at preferences, this is a single record in a prefs table. And as I edit values here, they're like globals everywhere because there's only, you know, but they're shared with everyone because these are text fields, right? So it's, that's how you solve that, Stu. You do, we do that all the time. So, yeah, it's just a matter of thinking about that, right? So, anyway, hopefully folks have a good weekend. Uh, we're kind of out of time. It is Friday. My voice is losing. Have a good weekend, weekend, folks. We'll see you Monday. Oh, email. Send an email to support at RC Consulting if you uh, have a question or comment or you, or you want me to send me a hate email that Ruben sucks. Uh, we also take those at support at rcconsulting.com. <laughs>